Thank you, Cheryl. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Hope, hope everything is okay. Uh, my name is Hoy. I'm the moderator for today in the aptly named panel, The Travel Industry's Path to Recovery. Uh, just a quick introduction. Uh, I'm the founder of Hitchbird. We are a destination weddings website helping uh, brides and grooms from around the world connect with wedding venues and vendors in Asia. Um, our, we, we're joined today by an awesome panel of experts who can share insights what's happening in the travel sector around Asia and the rest of the world. So I'm going to pass uh, around for the panelists to introduce themselves. Uh, Paul, do you want to go first? Paul's joining us from Singapore. Hi everyone, um, so I'm Paul, I'm Senior Director with Skyscanner. I'm based in Singapore, I've been with Skyscanner for seven years now. Um, Skyscanner is one of the world's leading travel providers um, with 100 million monthly users. Thank you, Paul. Um, next, we have uh, George. George is joining us from Jakarta. Hello, everyone. So my name is George. I'm CEO of Ticket.com. We continue to strive to become the most customer-centric travel platform in Indonesia and Southeast Asia. We've been growing 100% year after year for the past three years, minus COVID years, obviously. And we want to democratize travel in this region. I think we are seeing some very encouraging signs at this point. Thank you, guys. Thank you, George. And, and our final panelist, uh, Kelvin, joining us from Singapore also. Kelvin, over to you. Hi. Hi, everyone. Um, this is Kelvin from Utrip. I'm the general manager for Utrip here in Singapore. Um, what Utrip do is we do offer a multi-currency travel wallet for users to pay overseas and across different currencies over 150 currencies. Uh, we're currently in Singapore, in Thailand, looking to offer to more different places in Southeast Asia to let our users to ensure the best exchange rates for the payment experience. Thank you, Kelvin. Um, so before we kick off with the questions, just a uh, you know, little background. We all know the travel industry has been hit quite hard over the last eight, eight nine, ten months. We have government lockdowns, flight restrictions, quarantine measures, and so forth. And couple that, we're seeing sort of uh, waves of COVID infections sporadically in different countries at different times. So this doesn't help the situation. Um, as such, you know, the hotels and the airline industry has been hit quite hard with many employees out of work or in furlough. Um, it represents huge challenges to local governments and also for those employed locally um, within the travel sector and around the travel sector. Uh, a recent survey by the uh, WTTC, the World Travel and Tourism Council, shows that in the last five years, one in five new jobs created were related to the travel industry. So this is a huge, huge statistics and can have important consequences if we enter into an economic downturn. So today's panel aims to share insight in, into the travel industry. Um, perhaps we'll learn from the panelists uh, some of the uh, new strategies they're adopting this year. Uh, and we'll hopefully we'll also discuss uh, the recovery aspects. You know, when can we travel again? What needs to be in place for travel to resume? Um, so before we start, uh, just to digress a little bit uh, and to remind the audience and the listeners, and in the spirit of polling, we have our own poll today. Uh, we're asking a very simple question, and the question is, when do you think you and your family will travel overseas again? Would it be in, for example, you know, Q2 next year, third quarter? Let us know. There's a little poll button on 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 the uh, on the app or the, uh, the or the browser. Please click on that and let us know. Okay. So let, let's kick off with the questions. We're going to focus on sort of uh, uh, what's happening currently. I mean, 2020 is a pretty bad year for travel and tourism. Um, and the first question is this. In terms of marketing and sales strategies, how have these evolved, changed the last eight or nine months since the beginning of the travel bans for your company? So uh, maybe George, I see you first. Do you want to tackle that question first? Well, at one point in time, we thought we we're going to die, right? Because we have minus 99% <laughs> of our sales. And so we have to adjust the marketing accordingly. But I think more important is the message, right? So. We send out an empathetic message. We know what people are going through and we give as much as information about uh, traveling, the restrictions and all that, make them comfortable around it. And most importantly is the kind of message that, you know, our customer service is always there because we have seen massive, massive increase in customer call to customer service, 15 times increase because people want to refund and reschedule their ticket. And then we, we focus on that, right? We're tackling that 
And that itself becomes mm. uh, a marketing message because people know that in the future, when you have issues like this, when they travel, they don't have to worry. We will, we will take care of uh, uh, all the uncertainties around, around travel during COVID because we believe that uh, pandemic is not just going to be this time. So we, it's going to help us to better prepare for the future. Thanks, George. Um, Paul, would you like to make a comment from, from Skyscanner? I'm sure you experienced some of this. Yeah, I mean, similar to George, I'm thinking about the, the two time horizons you mentioned there, Hoy. At the beginning of the pandemic, we very much focused on supporting the travelers and partners. So that was surfacing information um, to travelers, um, what's the current status, um, advice, um, help, um, using all of our sort of own. Uh, and operating channels of PR, social content, and so on. Um, and also, the other constituent that we've got is there's the travelers, but there's also the partners. So, we work with a lot of the DMOs, a lot of the airlines, and a lot of the um, OTAs. And the way we were supporting them is very much with travel um, information um, and data. Um, again, with 100 million users. Um, but one of the, the um, huge assets that we've got is just this insight mm. into the, the traveler intent, what are people thinking. Um, so that was back then, and that's kind of shifted now that, as George said, it, you know, it, it went down pretty much 100% in March, April. It's slowly starting to come back, but nowhere near to the pre-pandemic levels. So it's still continuing to support them with information. Where can they go? What are the travel restrictions? Um, do I need a visa? Are there travel corridors? Um, will I need to quarantine myself? Um, and I think that'll be a, a huge focus over the next couple of months is, is continuing to support travelers with information. Okay, thanks, Paul. Um, Kevin, over to you. Obviously, you, your business is a new trip. It's about uh, travel wallets. Uh, your perspective will be a little bit different. So any, mm -hmm. any strategy, sales and marketing strategies that's changed over the last eight to nine months for yourself? Yeah, as you rightly point out, Hoy, like, um, we're a little bit lucky to a certain extent, you know, like we are for us being a payment company, um, whether uh, people are going overseas or locally, they still need to pay. But obviously, you know, um, at least when we first started U Trip, you know, we focus on travelers. Um, and one of the key reasons why people use U Trip to pay is because of the exchange rates. So, you know, people enjoy paying cheaper in a more affordable using the best exchange rate from U Trip. And I think that's, we, we came to think about what other use case that we can use? What are the new uh, use case that we can use for our users during this period of time? It's about online shopping. You know, like nowadays, you know, online shopping is obviously one of the key aspects for, pe for people to spend their money. And, you know, like as much as a large part of your spending online would still be locally, but there are also many, many popular uh, overseas merchants. For us, say for example, in Singapore, a lot of us spending in Taobao, you know, or ASOS, you know, using other currencies and things like this. And I think, you know, that's where YouTube come in. And I think that's why we spend a lot of time um, telling users, you know, what's the best way to pay overseas? What's the best way to uh, pay with the best uh, currency rates using YouTube? And I think it's a good thing for travelers, you know, like myself as well. If I can't travel, at least I can get to buy something overseas to give me a little bit of a vibe that I'm still overseas there. That's right. And the 11-11 and the date's coming up. I think that'll be a big date for you as well, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So the next question, I think, um, focuses on beha user behavior changes, obviously customers. I mean, everyone listening to the panel, we're all travelers ourselves. Uh, and the question is, uh, from the user's point of view, what are they looking for now? What's changed over the last sort of eight to nine months? Um, you know, are they looking for more domestic locations? Are they... Uh, um, uh, and how is your business adapted for these needs? Uh, maybe poor George, would you, would you like to kick off? Sure, sure, happy to kick off. So um, uh, actually just a couple of weeks ago, we published a, a travel report called The New World of Travel, um, where we did extensive research across um, uh, our global audience. There were three key trends, and I think you know, most of these people are probably not going to be too surprised by. The first of which is an increase in one-way bookings. Um, and there's a number of use cases that you can think about that, you know, people sort of choosing where are they going to base themselves during the pandemic. And also just with the fluidity of the situation, um, it's often best just to book a one day because I don't know, um, you know when I can come back. So I have to sort of be flexible in the bookings. The second one is domestic. So we're seeing a significant shift 
from international to domestic, and I'm sure we'll talk more about that um, further on. But that's a, a huge trend that we're seeing, and we expect to continue moving forward as well. And then the third one that we've seen is the shorter booking window. So there's a lot more people booking within sort of seven days or seven to 30 days. And if we compare that in an index way compared to sort of several months ago or last year, people were booking holidays several months in advance. People are actually booking um, in shorter windows. Um, windows there. So those are the three key trends. That's interesting. Um, okay, uh, George, you also run an OTA. What do you think? So, um... Domestic hotels are the ones who rebound uh, much more quickly than flight. People are still wary about taking flight. And, um, you know, if they can travel by car uh, within an hour, three hours, or even up to seven, eight hours, they will choose to do that. So we see uptick in uh, vacations around major city centers, which are around one, three hour, eight hour drive, right? So I myself have, have done staycation uh, nine times in this past nine months. Uh, nine times. Nine times. So once right. every month, right, to take away <laughs> all the cabin fever. Some of it is within city. Some of it is an hour. Uh, some of it a three hours drive. And these are locales which are typically easy for you to social distance. Lots of mm. things. You might book a full uh, book a full villa, one bedroom, two bedroom, right? And so we're seeing a huge uptick in this. In some of these villas, you can have bookings all the way to December. While at other areas, you know, occupancy rate of hotel can be as low as in the teens, right? So really, really mixed. And I think this kind of behavior will actually stay even post-COVID. Because I myself and a lot of the blogs and a lot of the, the consumer that I, I watch, they, they discover new areas of travel, places that they don't normally stay, uh, a bit more secluded, uh, a bit more green. And I think with the closer distance, it allows them to do more frequent uh, uh, end of week or weekend vacation. So I, I'm seeing uh, it is there to stay. And, and to support it, we, we launched a bunch of product, uh, primarily focusing on flexibility. So you can buy ahead of time without knowing the dates when you want to, um, to book it, to book it, to book the hotel at a, at a good rate. And again, like you mentioned before, we are a huge part of the economy. 6% of Indonesian GDP is in tourism, employ 10% people. That's about 12 million people. Mm. So a lot. And so we're trying to uh, bring people into a tourist uh, place like Bali, which is you know currently experiencing less than ten percent occupancy rate. So we try to bring right. it up, and and and, and I think uh, we are we are slowly getting there to 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 that kind of uh, occupancy rate again. That's great. Obviously, George is commenting on the Indonesian market. Yes. Um, okay. Kevin, do you want to have a go at that one or? or? Um, I mean, more like about, very, yeah. very, very similar to um, what George and talk, talks about. Like, um, I think we see all, our, our user base also spending a lot more sort of uh, percentage of the spending in terms of like local travel. So mostly like local staycation and things like this. FMB being another key category. So, you know, I think some of the key things that is already covered by George and Paul. I, I think one of the key things that we see from a user perspective, um, two things they're looking for. One is uh, price. I think they're more price conscious than before. You know, one one reason is because like there are new deals coming up. You know, and obviously they are also having a lot more options. You know, at least locally for us, there are a lot more things for them to compare. So they become more price conscious. And for us, you know, if here in YouTube, we also spend a lot of time educating users via content, you know, via tips and guides and things like this to tell them you know what what the best place that you can spend you know in different places. Um, and then the other behavior they are obviously looking for is flexibility. I think mm. we all know like staycation, things like this with local or even some of them, uh, we also see some of the business travelers, they starting to travel. They're also looking for things that's much more flexible in terms of terms of tickets and also even from the price and, and all these kinds of things as well. So I think these are the two main things that we see you know, from a user base that they will be looking very much to us uh, now during COVID and pretty sure like, in the next 12 months or so. I mean, we talk about pricing, which is very important for, for staycations. I mean, on average, how, how much of a discount, everyone's discounting, of course, we all know that, have you seen across the board for, for product and services? I mean, hotels, staycations, or in your particular instance, you deal with a lot more different types of products. Um, yeah. 
I mean, like for, for us, like easily, there will be like something like 30, 40% discount. But, you know, like I, I think it really depends on like where the consumers are thinking. Some of them obviously are more the, the, the price conscious one that they would be willing to book something like a month in advance and to make sure that they get the cheapest price. But then if it comes to other spend category, you know, I would say easily anything like 10, 20%, that's what they're looking for as well. Yeah, 10 dollars is like huge amount. What about George, Paul, what about the hotels? I mean, they must be offering some amazing discounts and we're in the weddings industry we know what sort of rates they're doing so what, what do you think i mean for for us um i, I see the aov drops by about 40 percent average order value okay and then yeah. um i think for for some of the bigger chain hotel some of them have managed to only have a drop of 10 percent occupancy rate but their total rates drop by about 30 percent. so price is a huge differentiator bali for example you have a hotel that uh, only charge you 5 million for the whole month. And they used to charge you 5 million for a day, right? So you, you're talking about this kind of rates, varies a lot depending on how relevant they are in this, in this uh, COVID vacationing environment. So that's, that's what we're seeing. Okay. I tried, I tried to book a staycation to Sentosa and actually couldn't get availability. Um, obviously, Singapore domestic market is uh, quite different than other countries. So I think their occupancy for certain hotels, obviously, Sentosa is um, somewhat unique. Um, on the domestic side, it's quite interesting. So the, the Japanese government launched a campaign called the GoTo campaign and they actually provided um, financial incentives to travellers. I think it was up to 50% off um, hotels. Um, and then they also gave you vouchers um, that you could use in sort of restaurants and shops in the local destinations. And you've seen domestic travel really bounce back there. Um, so there's a lot of great deals for domestic travel. And I think the Japanese example is one that we're going to see um, played out a number of times, especially in this part of the world. I know um, the, the Australian Tourism Board are doing a similar thing um, as our regional um, tourism boards. So I think yeah, there'll be great deals and they'll be supported by um, the different government um, authorities around the, the region as well. Okay, so that's a good point. You talk about what, what the sort of governments need to do and, and, and it sort of moves, moves on to our next sort of theme, what's going to happen in the future. Let's ask that question directly. I mean, what do local governments need to do to help the travel industry? I mean, that's a, that's a long question. Um, you know, George, you've got a smile. Let, let's, let's see if you want to tackle this one. Well, I hope, I hope our government uh, can learn from the experience, like the way the Koreans and the have learned during the SARS crisis, right? So put things in place so that when a pandemic happens again, you can do the, the, the thing, right? I mean, wear a mask, you know, social distancing and tracing. Because as we have seen in markets like China, if you do it well, actually things can get back to normal after several months, right? Whereas at this point uh, in Indonesia, I don't think that we have uh, completely passed through the first uh, and the second wave yet, as in, in, in a lot of countries, uh, as well, but I think we have uh, learned quite a big deal on on how to uh, take care of people when they they uh, get to hospital, right? And I think good job uh, with a medical professional and government are providing a lot of stimulus. Against, like you mentioned, uh, tourism as a multiplier has a big multiplier effect. So then, uh, by give, uh, giving programs like you know some kind of a subsidy, right, on the taxes for flights, yeah. Yeah, right? And then even can go further as, as the one that Paul mentioned, uh, putting in uh, maybe 50% of the travel expense if you do a bundling of flight and hotel. I think that will help a lot, right? Mm -hmm. so I think there are, there are lessons to be learned from this experience. Uh, I noticed that people are a bit more open to uh, a little bit of invasion of privacy as long as it can help a bit in the tracing elements, right? <laughs> which is not always easy to, to push uh, but I think those are those are things that that uh, certainly we have learned. Everybody, everybody in, in Indonesia, uh, government, private, right? And I think I I, I hope that uh, in the future, if this kind of thing should break out again, uh, we will have a better way of tackling it. Okay, great. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll add a question. You can you can answer the question maybe, Paul and Kelvin. It, it, it's we're talking about the future. I mean, the real question is is not just the government, what must be done? I mean, there's steps A, B, C, D, of course, for the recovery. I'm going to sort of fact pour the questions into it together because we have five minutes left. Um, you know, the recovery process and future predictions. So over to you, Paul, what needs to be done 
for recovery to happen, both, you know, the local governments, the, the travel partners, even the users, you know, uh, and so forth. What, hap- what, needs to hap- what ha- needs to happen in the airports and so forth. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we could talk about this for, for a full hour. Um, I, think there, I think everybody knows that the travel industry is forever changed um, and how it rebounds and what we need to do. Um, I think it depends on are you talking about sort of local travel, um, then there is sort of regional travel, then there's domestic travel, and then there's global travel. Um, and how you approach each of those is quite different. My, uh, and this is backed up by some research data that we've done is that the general sentiment in Asia has actually been a little more cautious um, but in the short term. But in the longer term, I actually think Asia is actually extremely well positioned to bounce back. And you're seeing that just with the spike in cases and other geographies. Um, And then there's also, like George mentioned, there's the the social aspect of it. Um, You know, if you think about Singapore and Japan um, and Taiwan, Wearing a mask is actually generally accepted. Like you know, pretty much 100% of people are doing it. Um, but those are the um, activities that will actually help travel bounce back. But it is forever changed. So your experience in hotels and the airports, um, and I think that the re- the in Asia, um, the governments, the airports, the hotels, um, if they can coordinate, um, and I think that they're more likely to be successful at coordinating within the region. Um, I think actually Asia is actually quite well positioned to bounce back um, um, quite strongly in 2021. Kelvin? Um, two things for me. I think one is about having efficient and effective uh, public health measures, uh, for, especially for travelers. Like um, there are a wide range of options any government has to decide on. Say, for example, quarantine, how long are you going to quarantine for? 10 days, 14 days, 70 days. That's going to be like hugely ap- impacting the decision of travelers. Um, how do you do a test? Are you going to do a test before? Are you going to test when you arrive? How do you make it easy, but at the same time safe for public? I think that's one of the key aspects to look at. I think two is it has to start from somewhere. Um, I think travel is, is by itself is a behavior that is very driven by your peers. If you don't see anyone traveling, you're not going to go to. So say, for example, here we are in Singapore, you know, between Hong Kong and Singapore, there's a the news coming out to talk about travel bubble and things like this. You know, obviously, this is one of the measures by both sides of the government to think about, hey, what's the best way to start slowly pumping in the, the, the mindset of travel, starting with a small batch of people. And then over time, we can test whether the uh, public health measures is effective and also at the same time to sort of like spread it further to, to make sure that everyone starts to have this in mind while they want to make sure there's public health at the same time they can also travel happily as well. Thank you, Calvin. George, any, anything to add on that one before we slowly wrap, wrap this up? Uh, yeah, I think enforcement is key because if you, let's say you keep on testing people before they fly, then, you know, when people fly, come to their destination, they are safe, it's more likely for them to travel and more, more likely for other people to travel. So it's, it's important. Okay, um, final question. There's quite a few questions on the Q&A and I actually have a lot of these written down. Um, but the sort of final question and prediction, I mean, and it's, it's really the poll, I'd love to hear your thoughts, panelists. When, when do you think you guys would personally fly overseas with your friends and family? Uh, let's, let's, let's hear it from you. Uh, is it going to be Q2 next year, Q3 next year, end of next year? What do you think? Q1. Q1 within Q, Asia. Q1. I don't see the Q1 in Asia, Europe yeah. Because yeah. there's the Hong Kong-Singapore uh, travel corridor we spoke about. I think that's going to be in place soon. Yeah. Kelvin? Yeah. Next month, with again with the bubble, <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna be prepared to pay a little bit higher for the price for the ticket since everyone is already buying it. But I'm trying to do my best. Right. That's right. That's right. George, what about yourself? I'm trying to do one in December, anywhere that will accept us Indonesians on right. business <laughs> or tourist visa, we, I will go. <laughs> okay, uh, I think that's about it. That's all that we have time for. I'd like to thank the panelists, Paul from Singapore, George in Jakarta, Kelvin from Singapore. Thank you, listeners. Thank you, audience. Uh, take care, stay safe. All right, thank you. Thank Bye. you.